going to take me a moment. Here we go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, he, he needs to unmute. Mr. Sir, you're, you're live, but you are muted. Got can it. You, okay, good. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you have heard uh, in previous meetings from our uh, president, Marjorie Murray, I'm on the co legislative committee of the Center for California Homeowner Association Law, and our role is to advocate on behalf of the rights of individual homeowners. So we come at this from a different perspective uh, from the, uh, both the industry and the uh, HOA itself. Um, the problem that we see, first of all, there are three options that you've considered, which is a prohibition on posting only. Secondly is our proposal that during the, an emergency that individual notice of board meetings be required. And then the third option is what you're considering now, which uh, Mr. Uh, Hebert has uh, uh, put forward, and that is basically to do nothing. The problem that we see with the third option is that it uh, puts the burden on the individual homeowner to take action and anticipate that in the event of an emergency declaration that he has to notify the HOA or um, to know that he can he or she can do this when an emergency is declared. Now the problem with relying on that annual notice of all your rights and so forth is that what we get every year from our association is a very thick packet of stuff <laughs> that includes budgets and reports and notices of your rights and so forth. And to be quite honest with you, the great bulk of members do not read through that and so would not pick up on the fact that they could request uh, individual notice for all notices that would otherwise be sent by general delivery. Keep in mind that when people do that, that it applies to all notices, not just board meeting notices. So that if someone opts in to do this strictly because they want notice of board meetings during emergencies, they're gonna get a lot of notices and it will not end when the emergency ends. So there is in fact an additional cost associated with the do nothing option. Uh, secondly, I wanted to point out that with individual delivery, I think all HOAs and most if not all HOAs strongly encourage their members to opt in to receive individual delivery by electronic means, including email. And many, many people do that. One of our uh, legislative committee members uh, is aware that his large HOA, 60% of the members have opted in to receive email notice of individual, uh, when individual notice is required. So that if that holds true, and I'm, I haven't got it for my own HOA, but I suspect it's very large, because we are constantly being reminded, please sign up for email uh, notice. Uh, so that this cost issue, that is the one advance to support the do nothing option, is really unclear. And I think uh, we don't really know whether the cost would be greater with option two, the one that we favor, or option three, because once the emergency is over, you've got people who've signed up only because of the emergency situation, but they're gonna continue to be on the list to receive all notices, everything by individual notice. And it will continue until they say stop. Um, I would note that in the memo on page three, there's a statement, which is absolutely true, excuse me, absolutely true, that the option that we favor, quote, would achieve the highest degree of actual notice. And that is true, if you think about it. If you automatically do by individual notice, obviously more people are gonna know about the board meeting. And so this cost issue, we don't know if it's really gonna cost more 
to take option two than option three. And in any event, in an issue of this nature, which involves the right and ability of an individual homeowner to participate in self-governance, in other words, to exercise their right in a democratic structure, that that is very, very important, fundamentally important, and that cost should not be a deciding factor. So for that reason, we, <coughs> we really urge that you consider option two, which is simply to say, during the emergency, that notice of board meetings must be sent by individual delivery. It'll automatically end when the emergency is over, and that should limit the cost. Thank you. Yeah, so, no, those, those are good you. points. No, those are good points. Um, I guess we also, Linda or Brown, we saw your hand was up. Did you still want to uh, add on or no? I'm going to enable her now. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, I'm with a 60 unit condo. I've served on the board two or three times, uh, and I've been a member over 40 years. The majority of people will not read through the annual notice, and I would just encourage you to uh, have an, a reminder on agendas as well as posted uh, on bulletin boards that uh, what this option is. Thank you. That's all, thank you. No, no, those are good comments. Commissioners, do you have any comments? We also have Mr. Freely. Okay, and uh, yeah, and it looks like, and then, okay, Mr. Freely? Uh, you need okay, to am I live? Yes. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to comment. I'm Tom Freely, I'm the CEO of the California Association of Community Managers. I represent roughly 3,000 members that provide management and other services to homeowner and condominium associations across California. Existing law in 4045, as referenced by Mr. Hebert, doesn't need to be modified and accomplishes the notice requirements. We oppose the idea of having to mail out notices to hundreds or thousands of units where general notice is currently accepted. We are fine with another means in addition to posting, but it must be reasonable such as individual notice via email, unless mail delivery is specifically requested by a homeowner. Email seems to be the most sensible option, particularly when we are talking about Zoom links. To automatically require mail delivery as a default results in costs that are, that are not only exorbitant, an already cash-strapped community during difficult times. In some of these medium and large communities, the costs can be significant. We like the idea re raised previously by Commissioner King that would allow posting and an opt out of email delivery, but mail delivery only upon request. Thank you for your time. I have a question for you, Mr. Freely. How would you have the email addresses, or do you have the email addresses to the, your current constituents? Um, management companies typically will, through the opt in option, for the homeowners that want to have emails uh, directly sent to them. The law currently states that they have to opt into it, which means on an annual basis they provide their email address. Um, management companies will also often just simply say, hey, have, would you prefer to have email notifications? If so, here's your form. Please fill this form out. So it is an ongoing process to be able to collect email addresses, but it's always at that homeowner's acceptance. And then it looks like uh, Steve Link also has another comment. Uh, let me reactivate him. There we go. Yeah, just to follow up, um, it's possible that that uh, members might miss the notification in the annual uh, uh, notification that you can sign up to get individual delivery. But I just would make the point that if a member is having an issue that they are concerned about in our association, then they should contact the uh, manager and then it's easy for them to sign up. Um, it, it's, you know, if, if someone has a problem, they will contact us and they will get signed up. And one quick last point, I want to draw an analogy. Um, 
I live in Carlsbad. We have 130,000 people who live here. The city of Carlsbad is arguably a much larger, more important governmental entity than our HOA is. Um, shouldn't this, if individual delivery is, uh, should apply to associations, shouldn't all municipalities have to send individual notice to every single one of their residents about every single one of their meetings? Because it, it's just, the residents, if they have an issue, they will have to seek out some information. They have, in some cases, have to seek out the information. We can't be requiring every municipality uh, for every one of their uh, uh, Brown Act meetings send individual letters to every constituent. And the cost is just excessive. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boyer Vine. If we're done with public comment. Are we? There's one more. Okay. Uh, okay. From uh, Tom Sir, Mr. Sir. I have to re reenact in there. There you go. Unmute, please. Um, I would like to make it very clear that individual notice does not mean, for most associations, if not all, does not mean strictly everyone gets a notice to the United States Postal Service. In fact, I would venture to uh, say that a large number, if not most of members, would get the notice by email. That's simply what happens. And I would put the question to those who are opposing the second option, I would put to them the question, how many of your members have opted in to receive individual notice by email? And I would guess that it's a pretty large number because it's always in the, to the advantage of an association to have as many people receiving individual notice by email as possible. That big fat packet that I mentioned that goes out every year, that's a huge expense because it's heavy. And so those, you know, Opting in to receive that by email, that makes absolute sense. It doesn't clutter up your mailbox and you can store it and so forth for future reference. So that's the point that I would like for the commissioners to keep in mind. Individual notice does not mean that it has to be that expensive. And it would be limited to the time of the emergency. That's the key point. You're talking about emergency uh, regulations. And let's hope to goodness that the emergency that we're in now is going to be temporary. Thank you. Crystal, there's one more person who hasn't spoken yet. Ms. Stanaway, uh, shall I turn her on? Okay. Please. Uh -huh. There you go. You need to unmute yourself, uh, Anne. Um, if you, yeah, sometimes if you do star six, I'm not sure if you called in. No, she's on a computer connection. Yeah, go ahead and, okay. Ms. Stanaway, we can't hear you. Your, your connection is muted, Ms. Stanaway. Yeah, we've had this problem before. Um, Ms. Stanaway. It, Maybe she can call in. Uh, yeah, if you can go back to the, the instructions for connecting and try to make a phone connection, uh, for whatever reason, your your internet connection is remaining muted, and we've had that problem before at prior meetings. And the using the phone instead seems to work as a workaround. So right. if you want to give that a try, and then uh, I, let's. Talk, I, I know Commissioner Boyer Ryan had uh, some questions that she wanted to raise. Let's take talk or listen to her right now before right. we hear from Stan, Miss Stanway. I actually didn't have questions. I just am glad that Brian found that existing law and think it seems to be a, a fair approach um, to let people make their own decisions how they want to receive information when they're living in an HOA and not assume that I know better than the, my, my neighbor as to how they want to receive information. So I would support using that as our basis for notice and, and also it's you know, this is a narrow topic we're looking at and getting, you know, I'm hearing complaints about that process more generally, and I don't think we want to get into that in this um, topic. That's a good point. Uh, Commissioner Carrillo? 
Uh, completely agree. Uh, I'm also glad that uh, Brian found that, pulled that rabbit out of his hat. And having found that, I, I think now we need to do nothing, just uh, rely on existing statutory law. I, I think the comment clears up any confusion. So I, I think we don't need to do anything here. Okay, I think uh, Commissioner Simpson and then Commissioner King. Um, yeah, I would concur with both uh, David and Diane, uh, particularly since in looking at the statute, it doesn't seem to put any uh, time limitations on when someone can request an individual notice. It, it's, they're notified of it, I guess, annually, but it appears to me that at any time during the calendar year, they can make that request if they haven't already. So if there's a, an emergency situation that arises, they can affirmatively choose to get an individual notice either by um, electronic communications or, or by uh, uh, mail. So Commissioner, I, I I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner King? Yeah, I, I like the way this discussion is going because as you may recall from the other meeting, I was very worried about individual mailing of notices. So I'm perfectly happy with the statute that uh, Brandon and his staff have found. But uh, just to acknowledge the audience comment, uh, there was an inquiry if we wanted to make a requirement that uh, this uh, notice that they could elect how to be notified should be more than in the annual policy statement, but should be uh, more regularly uh, uh, reminded of people in, I guess, minutes or something like that. I'm not saying I'm advocating for that, but I, I do want to acknowledge that someone did make that very good point and that we should probably think about, do we want to at least tweak this statute that we all seem to be in favor of to have more notice about the opportunity to select the form of your general notice. <laughs> no, I, I do like how, Brian, you added the comment. And I think hopefully that'll help put a burden on some of the HOAs to figure out a way to provide notice of other ways to opt in, either through post-its or bulletins, something, because I, I thank you audience for highlighting how, you know, oftentimes the contact preferences will be buried in a stack of documents that people don't read. And I think that brings a very practical light to what we're looking at here. So that, that part is helpful. Do we have, Ms. Stanaway or no? No, I haven't seen her come back in through her telephone. Um, if I could offer a couple points. Um, one is, I, I think, I, I agree with Mr. Sir that, you know, if I, oh. She's here, okay, good. Ms. Stanaway. Stanaway. After messing around with this computer enough, I finally got it to unmute. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> Oh, there's, there's one thing that you're overlooking with the individual notice. Let me just pull up my Davis Sterling Act here for just a second. Uh, the individual notice in uh, 4040, uh, it, what it does is it says that if a person of, uh, if a provision of this act requires that the association deliver a document by individual delivery, the document shall be delivered by one of the following methods. It gives number one and number two. Now, those two methods are fine. And uh, of course you can, and it's a good idea to ask for email of all the documents because email is much easier to manipulate than anything else. Uh, however, some associations, I won't name them, but some associations, if you ask for individual delivery and then ask for email specifically, they will write you back and say, we have the option of choosing and we choose first class mail. And then they go ahead and, and put the first class mail into the US Postal Service on the day before the meeting is scheduled. When the meeting actually begins on that next day, you don't have notice of the meeting because the meeting was lawfully deposited with the US mail, which says that when you deposit it with the mail service, it is deemed delivered. So they're in lawful compliance, but you never get uh, notice of the meeting in a timely manner. Getting notice in a timely manner is very, very important important to some people. Now, I suggest that if the commission 
uh, wants to make sure that everybody gets their notices in a timely manner, it amend individual document delivery to read that if email is requested, email shall be mandated. That makes sense? I understand. Go ahead, um, Brian. Yeah, but I, I, I'm thinking that's that's a statutory change. That's 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 outside the scope of what we could do. I think. Uh, Brian, do you want to speak to that? Commissioner Creo has his hand up. Yeah, Brian, I, I had a question that's somewhat specifically for you, ad addressing the um, the comment that the member of the public just made. What's your take on the impact on the issue that she raised of subdivision B, which requires that if a member identifies a secondary address that the association shall deliver an additional copy to that secondary address. So to me, if, you know, not casting aspersions, but, you know, hypothetically, if an association is um, standing their ground and only mailing uh, by first class mail meeting notices and doing it, you know, the day before the actual meeting and taking advantage of any potential time lag, I think the subdivision B should apply there. And, you know, the first time that happens and, you know, an association member gets their notice late, they can then specify as a second address, their email. Uh, well, and all I can say to that is been there, done that. What happened? And have been fighting about it for at least three years. Huh? So what, ha what happened when you specified email? Did, did you get an email? No. No, she said that they, they, say that they retain the or reserve the authority to make a decision on which one to do so that that is an issue i don't i i think what david's saying is there's this ability i i hear what you're saying about subdivision a but b gives the second way to get the delivery right. if you're finding them playing playing games right so. I, I think you should only get caught on that once and then and then the second time when you specify under subdivision b a secondary address requiring I, 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 electronic delivery, I, I think at that point, uh, there's a separate problem. So Brian, what, what's your take on B? Does, does it uh, say what I think it says? Let me offer uh, a slightly different uh, bit of information that I think is relevant here. Um, and I, I'm always want to be careful to say that, you know, we're not, we're not weighing in on the lawfulness or illegality of anything that's right. actually done in a particular case. But I will say that the rules for delivering notice of a board meeting um, in uh, Civil Code Section 4920 begin by saying, uh, except as provided in Subdivision B, which is an emergency, um, and not the kind of emergency we're contemplating. It's uh, an emergency meeting, which is governed by its own standards. The association shall give notice of the time and place of a board meeting at least four days before the meeting. So as a general rule, you, you are not permitted to give notice one day before the meeting. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things we find in our, our work on CIDs historically is that a lot of times the problems that we hear people describing to us are about, aren't about what the law requires, but they're about compliance with the law. Um, and, you know, we, in this particular study, we can't cure compliance problems. We can, we can adopt good standards and rules and requirements, but compliance is beyond the scope of the issue. Um, yes, Mr. Cur or Commissioner Correa. Uh, thank you. If I can re retain the uh, the floor for a second, um, I, I fully agree with Brian's uh, statement that um, the the question for us is is defining a statutory scheme that provides rules um, that, if complied with, uh, provide adequate notice. Um, and so I, I think I think this circles us back to the the original developing consensus that the the existing statutes provide for adequate due process here. And I, I, I think I'm still at the point where I don't feel like we need to do anything. Um, I, I do want to just see there's a, a comment or two hands raised or three hands raised and you still had your hand up. Did we address your concerns or hear you? A absolutely. And I totally agree with what you're saying. I absolutely okay. agree with what you're saying. I agree really? the current law is the way it should stay. 
Okay. okay. And then Tom, sir. Yeah, he, he's spoken a couple times. His hand may just be still up from earlier. They, it looked like Linda Brown's hand went up while we were talking. I'm just, uh, just checking in. Uh, I mean, okay, it, it's been removed. Oh, <laughs> it's going back and forth. Okay, Tom, sir. Well, before I turn him back on, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Simpson was had his hand up, and uh, I'd just like to hear what he has to say before we go back to people who've already spoken on this topic. Um, I was looking at, at David, your um, comment about subdivision B. Um, I'm I'm not so sure that's clear that. Um, my wife and I, we have a condo in Pasadena, so we're a member of an HOA down there. Um, and we request our information um, to be sent to our secondary address to them in Sacramento. I'm not so sure B refers to a second um, means of transmitting the information as opposed to a second place to send it. That, that's That's how I would interpret it if I was if I was an HOA and reading it so what what's what's um, I, I'm sort of um, I, I'm still I think the current law structure is 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 the, the the proper one but it's it's not clear to me and maybe Brian would have a, a view about this about in subdivision a where it says first class postage or a paragraph a paragraph one, paragraph two is email facsimile, that who it is that gets to make the choice between uh, first class mail number one or um, email or electronic means number two. Is that the HOA or is that the, the individual requesting it? So um, to back out and address a, a couple of the points that were on the table, um, subdivision B first. Uh, I don't recall that having been intended as a way to uh, require email in addition to uh, physical delivery. I just don't remember that being on the table. When we discussed it in years past, it was much more uh, what Commissioner Simpson was talking about, where you know you are you own a second home, you want your you want to receive notices while you're there at that address and when you're somewhere else at the other address, or there's joint owners or whatever. Um, the other thing about that provision is it's limited to certain kinds of notices. And mm -hmm. I don't recall off the top of my head what those kinds were. I could figure it out if we, if pretty quickly if we needed to know, but I think that they were the most serious kinds of notices, like a notice of delinquent assessments and things like that. So it's not everything. Um, and then on the, the point you raised, uh, Commissioner Simpson, um, I think you're right in reading that as not, as subdivision A, as not making clear whose election it is. Um, and I, I can only, I don't have clear recollection of this from when it was originally drafted, but my, my guess is that it was an intentional decision to leave flexibility there, assuming that the parties would work out whatever made the most sense for them. Um, and then I have one last point I've been wanting to make, and I, I also see Commissioner Boyer Vine's hand up, um, which is that I agree with Mr. Sir that you know the the importance of self government governance means that you you want to have effective notice of these meetings. Um, but I would say too that one of the things we talked about at the last meeting is that there's there's no obvious reason why notice of these emergency special emergency teleconference meetings, or, or the, the process provided there should be better than the process that exists for ordinary non-emergency situation board meetings. And in this instance, notwithstanding the importance of self-governance and participation in meetings, if you want to participate, the legislature and the commission on the commission's recommendation has already concluded that the existing law is how to handle notice of board meetings, that you do general notice, and then you give individual notice to anybody who wants it, and you notify them once a year to let them know about that option. So if that's good enough for the importance and dignity of self-governance generally, I don't see why it wouldn't be good enough for these kinds of meetings where the only difference is they're being conducted on a teleconference. Um, and then, 
before I hand it over, there's one other thing I remember, which is I believe that uh, Elaine Roberts Musser's letter suggested another possibility, which is that we could require that notices of these teleconference meetings, emergency related teleconference meetings be posted to the association's website if they have one, uh, which would provide another way of sort of publicizing the fact that here's something going on that you might be interested in and um, also providing the URL in electronic form so people could just click through. That prompted Mr. Freely to put his hand up. But I'd like to hear from Commissioner Boyer Vine before going back to the audience queue. So I, I actually went back and looked at B. And I'm not sure I agree with you, Rick, because there's a uh, the use of additional copy was what got me to where David is. But then when you talk, I think it really is limited to just the documents in one and two for mm -hmm. where you can get an additional copy. So David, it may not be as broad as all notices. So it may not provide that safe harbor. I was going to argue with Rick about additional copy until I saw one and two, and it looks like it's just those are the types of notices that you can have an additional uh, go to go through another method. And I don't know like, what one and two are, but. Do you feel like that's the kind of ahead. thing that we can address through a, a use note comment, or will we actually have to change the text of A to make it clear that, it, that the means of delivery is at the election of the member? Um, well, I think you'd have to change it, but but I, I if you changed it, I'd be very concerned because you're getting into a much broader topic than this study. And where Brian's ended was where I started. If this is good enough for all the notices that are going out, it ought to be good enough for this situation. That, that's where I was going with that was in order to resolve the potential ambiguity, we have to take the large step of amending A and then you get to the problem that Brian has and that sort of brings you back around to maybe we just shouldn't do this because we're inventing a problem. Could be inventing it, yeah. Um, um, there, we're seeing repetition, people who've commented before commenting again, which is not inherently problematic. It's the kind of thing that happens in face-to-face -face meetings, but um, I would just say at some point we're going to start um, hearing the same ideas again, and so you may want to call the question, but uh, should I allow Mr. Sir to speak? If I think because he's had his hand up for so long. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sir? Uh, I'm working on it. Here okay. we go. Okay. There okay, I have something new to say. <laughs> I won't repeat. Um, I, first of all, let me just mention that our organization, as, the, as far as I know, it's the sole organization that advocates on behalf of individual members. And we're always in this cat and mouse game because we encounter so many associations throughout the state where there is all kinds of um, abuse of the governing structures where you get a clique of people on the board who retain control by avoiding elections, not just, or just not holding elections, and playing around with these election rules and nominating rules and so forth. So what we've learned to do is to really try to draft statutes that are less subject to abuse. So that's what we're focused on. And that's why we believe that option two is, is the thing. But I did very much uh, like the suggestion of Commissioner King that maybe you should give notice when there's, a, I think this was your, what you were saying, maybe there could be a single notice that goes out to everyone at the beginning of an emergency that tells people if you want to receive notice of board meetings electronically, this is what you do. That would help a lot. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, we can call the question then. Uh, well, does someone? I, I, I move that we do nothing. Right. Okay. I will second and that. Who seconded it? I'm sorry, Commissioner Carrillo. Okay. So, all those in favor of leaving the where the where we are in the position of, uh, we already have an opt-in clause, say aye. <laughs> it looks aye. Like, so it's a majority, uh, the majority carries. Any yeah. abstentions? No abstentions. Related. All right. 
Okay, then we'll go ahead and leave things as they are. Uh, Brian, did you want to go? We can. Did you guys want to break? We're at eleven twenty right now. We can push through. Okay. Um, uh, related mm -hmm. question, which is, um, is the commission okay with the comment language that's proposed on page three? I like the comment. Yeah. I'm fine with it. Commissioner Rubin and Vic Commissioner King. Yes. Okay. All, All right. right. We'll it. Can we take five. Yeah, I think that makes sense. We can take five. All right. And the audience will be right with you. So we're going to go ahead and take five. Brian, do you want to explain how uh, we should all leave our screens up? Yeah, you should mute your microphone. We've had incidents before where somebody left their mic live and they're unintentionally broadcasting their family life to the to the world. So mute your mic and mute your video and then we'll all come back at 1125. Thank you, everyone.
All right, it is 11.25. You want to call or do you want to give? I'd give them a minute or two to show up. Yeah. Three commissioners. Brian, we have a forum. I think we should go ahead and start. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, the next issue that I want to talk about, about this proposed law, uh, is discussed in the first, first supplement to Memorandum 2020-48. Um, and I'll return to the main memo in a moment. But what we're also, in Memo 50, we're going to be talking about a letter we received from the CACM, the California Association of Community Managers, urging us to look at electronic voting um, in CIDs during an emergency. And um, one of the issues that they raise, which is also uh, commented on in a letter we received from Marjorie Murray, is um, how would it work to have teleconference meetings where votes are opened and tabulated. Because under the existing procedures and CIDs for elections, um, all of the votes cast by mailed ballot are to be opened and counted in a meeting of the board or the membership. And there's also language that says, any candidate or other member of the association may witness the counting and tabulation of votes. So that's easy when you're doing face-to-face -face meetings. How does it work in a teleconference? Um, and I think that our proposed law, it's my opinion that our proposed law is adequate to address that because one of the prongs that's in our proposed law is a requirement that every director and member has the same ability to participate in the meeting that would exist if the meeting were held in person. So you have this other independent statute that says any candidate or member uh, may witness the counting and tabulation of the votes. And this new proposed provision that says every director and member has the same ability to participate in the meeting that would exist in a face-to-face -face meeting. I believe that in order to conduct this process lawfully, an association could use teleconferencing so long as they made it possible to witness the opening and tabulation of the ballots. Um, and I, you know, I think that that would mean, you know, holding up a ballot in front of the camera, opening it, showing the vote, uh, somehow announcing the vote so that it can be counted. Um, and so everybody who's on the Zoom call could witness the opening and counting of the votes, um, just as if they were in a face-to-face -face meeting I assume you'd do something similar. You know, you'd you'd open a ballot and you'd announce how the person uh, cast their votes, and uh, if a person wanted to confirm that what you were saying was true, they could walk up and look at the ballot. Um, and I think that we could achieve that through teleconferencing without any special law addressing it. Um, and so, uh, you know, my base recommendation on this point is I don't think we need a statute on addressing this, but that it might be helpful to add comment language, again, to help people understand what the intention is. Um, and on the, the second page of the supplement, I've got proposed comment language. Paragraph B5 provides that a meeting conducted under this section must afford every director and member of the association the same right to participate in the meeting that the person would have had in a face-to-face -face meeting. This would include the right to witness the opening and counting of paper ballots under section 5120A. 
To comply with that requirement, the meeting would need to provide video that clearly shows the opening of ballot envelopes and the votes cast by the ballots sufficient to demonstrate the accuracy of the process. Is that too much? I see Diane look, having consternation. Well, I, I have consternation when we talk about electronic voting, <laughs> just generally in these settings, but I'm confused. I don't understand the process. So potentially you could be in a pandemic and have the vote come up to elect officers, but those would have been received in hard copy. Yes. That would just always be the case. They would always be received in hard copy? Under existing okay. law. If, okay, if that's the case, then I guess that works. I was just wondering whether you would ever go to this emergency meeting and actually just raise your hand to vote for a director. It's not, it's not the way it works because it's um, secret voted ballots. Yes, for the most part, yes. There's an exception for large associations to elect directors by acclamation, I believe, but it's quite large. Um, I think it's 6,000 or something like that. But other than that, I believe the only way you can do it is through these hard copy mailed ballots. And the, it's okay. a double envelope system. So the, the voter is identified on the outside of the envelope and signs it. And then the, there has to be an election inspector who receives the ballots, confirms the eligibility of the members to cast the vote. And then the inside envelopes do not identify the voter and then those are collected and opened in a meeting um, and the results tabulated in the meeting. And so this would just provide some guidance that yes, that is the legal requirement. And if you're gonna do this in a teleconference meeting, do it in a way that complies with the statutory requirement that members have the right to witness. So, so that makes sense to me as you explain it, because I didn't know how it worked, but I, I think it begs the question of, is electronic voting allowed generally in these meetings for other matters? And maybe that's the last memo we're gonna to get to. So. Yeah, let's save that for the last memo. Okay. There's one hand up uh, from, oh, Commissioner Carrillo? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, com yeah, Tom Freely. I wanna say I that you now speak freely, but I won't. <laughs> I think that'll be the, won't be the first time, but I appreciate the hearing. <laughs> Um, I want to express, uh, again, appreciation to Mr. Ebert and the CLRC staff for taking the time to analyze the recommendations raised by CACM and thank the Commission for undertaking these important issues during the time of a public emergencies, such as this pandemic, which drove the original suggestion of electronic voting. Um, with regards to adding electronic voting to the study, I reiterate that it is indeed critical during emergencies to have both a system in place that enhances voter participation, has a financial savings on a cash flow already negatively impacted by reduced assessments related to, to uh, obvious layoffs throughout the country and throughout California, and most importantly, saves lives by supporting social distancing in our current pandemic. Associations typically operate on zero-based budgets and all costs are ultimately borne by the homeowners, which includes their board of directors. Homeowners who, in a time of economic crisis, cannot afford any extra expenses. Homeowners who, during an emergency, may not be in a position to fill out a ballot and mail it in. We acknowledge the Commission's desire to keep this consensus, non-controversial study, but would suggest that the Commission take a look at this sometime in the future. We believe technology has evolved since legislation was considered in 2014 and just as participation has increased with teleconferencing during COVID, we anticipate voter participation would increase with electronic voting as well under current conditions. There are 24 states, including some neighboring states that have legislatively passed and successfully implemented electronic voting. Second, however, we support the staff's proposal to allow for the counting of ballots during the teleconference, as long as there is a video component. We are talking about private corporation CID elections here, not national, statewide, or local public elections. Voter apathy is unparalleled and severe in our communities, and we can't let the per perfect get in the way of the good. Teleconferencing and electronic voting would most certainly enhance participation in these communities. Again, thank you for your time. Um, before we hear from Mr. Creel, I just want to suggest um, it was my hope that we would focus exclusively on the 
point about use of teleconferencing to witness the opening of ballots before we get into talking generally about electronic voting methods, which we will discuss, but it's the next memorandum. Um, and so I, uh, is that what you were gonna comment on Commissioner Carrillo? The general topic of electronic elections? Uh, no, only by inference. Uh, my, my main comment was, uh, I, I was going to agree with Diane. Um, I, I, I like the proposed comment language. Um, and and the, the only thing I was going to say about when we get to electronic voting, uh, there's a fairly easy and obvious way of including or reconciling the comment language with um, opening ballots electronically. Um, who, whoever winds up being the person who counts the ballots, they just share their screen and you can watch them open the emails and then everyone can see the content of the emails voting yay or nay or whatever it happens to be. So, so you know, looking to the future, I see the comment language that we're proposing here, which I'm in favor of, it will be consistent with what we eventually probably wind up doing on electronic voting. Um, Mr. Sir, were you going to comment on the electronic part? Because I think maybe we can call the question and then move to, we can get to the electronic. Uh, portion of the comment or the memos. What do yes. you think? Just a oh. brief comment on the vote counting uh, issue. This is a huge. Mm, we can't hear you. Awesome. Do we do oh, Mr. Sir, are we, let me. Do we lose him? He's, oh, there he is, but he's uh, muted. Okay, uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Go ahead, okay. Mr. Sir. Uh, commenting just on the on the vote counting, um, by way of background information, in my experience, the way this usually happens is you call a board meeting or a membership meeting, and then the vote counting itself really takes place in a separate room. They, they go off in the back room while the meeting continues, and anybody who wants to witness the counting can go in that back room and, and witness it. So that means that, you know, it's a split thing. <laughs> you'd have to take the, the uh, uh, camera off of what's going on in the meeting and shift it over to what's going on in the back room. Well, so that's just a practical problem. You wouldn't and have. But holding up the ballots to the screen, I, that seems rather clumsy and it could be really time consuming for a large association that's kind yeah. of thousands uh, of ballots. Commissioner, I'm, not to interrupt you, but I think there's a, an under, a misunderstanding. Uh, Commissioner Boyer-Vine? Well, I mean, if, if it if literally they go off into another room and the people who want to go into the room go to another room, at least with Zoom, you have breakout rooms and you don't lose the rest of the meeting. So the meeting can continue and the people who want to go witness that can go into the breakout room. That's Oh, I see. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, uh, and, and the statute just asks for sufficiency. So like if your group didn't want that, then you could come up with something that would allow for some way for public uh, notice or public uh, observation. Commissioner Carrillo? Uh, I'll move the comment language. Okay, anyone want to second it? So Commissioner Simpson is seconding it. All those in favor of uh, adopting the comment language, say aye. 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 Okay, so you have a majority, Brian, it carries. The so motion carries. I, I have one thing I need to circle back to the main memorandum 2020-48, which is there is this draft tentative recommendation, which the commission has already decided to adjust by um, adding comment language on the method of notice delivery and on the count, counting tabulation of ballots. But there is the broader question of whether you, you will approve that draft as a tentative recommendation to be sent out for public comment. I think that's where we were already, um, but I, I appreciate the clarification. Uh, are we all in agreement with that? Do you um, just take a quick vote or just yeah. note consensus? So we're all, it's, you have the majority support. Okay. Victor, well, everyone is, yeah. Were you okay? Okay, thumbs up. So I didn't see any no's or abstentions. Good. All right. Um, thank you. That's, that's good progress. Um, now, memorandum 2020-50 is about electronic elections. And this was the suggestion uh, from CACM. And I believe Mr. Freely already made a statement sort of explaining their position. Um, and the this is different from the other proposal that we just 
uh, approved for public comment. This is a different reform. Uh, and it's about changing the, the way elections would be conducted in a CID during an emergency to allow them to be done electronically without, and in, in place of the existing law, which requires this uh, double envelope mailed ballot system that I described. Um, I, uh, when I presented this in the memorandum, for discussion. I didn't engage too heavily into the, the merits of it. Um, I put it in the context of uh, sort of the posture that we're taking in these emergency related reforms, or at least that I suggested early on that we take. Um, and it was my recommendation that we focus our, our resources on emergency related reforms that would be uh, easily enactable by the legislature on the assumption that during an emergency, uh, the best help that we could give would be to sort of hand them over things that could be adopted quite easily and would fix problems. Um, if we hand them over something that is controversial and that's going to consume a lot of committee resources and a lot of time in, in negotiations and hearings and a lot of stakeholder time, um, that they just may not be in a position to make good use of that. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, in the, the years that I've worked on CID law, I would say the two most controversial topics, one of them is elections and the election process. The other is, I think, assessment collection. Um, I think both of those are sort of third rails. And, and if you were to bring the legislature a bill on either topic, it would not be an easily enacted bill. It would, it would be a very difficult bill. And that, that is what the evidence suggests from the last time someone attempted this. Uh, I think it was in 2014. Um, there was a bill, yeah, 2014 AB 1360 Torres that was introduced on electronic voting in CIDs. And it wound up being a two year bill so there was enough controversy that it could not um, it, it could not traverse the legislative process in a single year. It got converted into a, a two-year bill, um, and then it failed in its second year. And one of the things that I find um, well, and, and I I list the you know I looked at the committee analyses uh, committee analyses for this bill, and I and I list the the opposition and support, um, the support for the bill was the Community Associations Institute, uh, which was, I believe, the sponsor, Community, California Association of Community Managers, California Association of Realtors, Educational Community for Homeowners, ECHO, seems like they changed their name, uh, Congress of California Seniors, South Orange County Economic Coalition, and the South Orange County Regional Chamber of Commerce. So those were the supporters on the bill. And then the opposition was California Alliance for Retired Americans, California Common Cause, Center for California Homeowner Association Law, the Secretary of State, and a group called Verified Voting. Um, so, you know, pretty substantial polarization in terms of the reaction to the bill. And the thing that I, I found particularly interesting about the bill is that it, it's, it was quite a modest proposal. It did not mandate anything except that you could use electronic voting in your CID if you came up with a system that met a bunch of really sensible and obvious requirements and the Secretary of State certified that that was true. Um, you know, the requirements included that your system had to be accessible to a person with a disability. Your system had to be secure from malware and from unauthorized remote access or control. There had to be a system for authentication of the voter's identity. There had to be secure communication between the voters and the system receiving the vote. Um, the users had to be able to authenticate receipt of their vote and that it had not been altered in transmission. Uh, they had to be able to receive a secure receipt 
of their vote cast. Um, you had the system had to be able to separate out the information about the voters from the votes cast so that you couldn't collate those two pieces of information and figure out who's who cast their votes how. Um, and the system had to provide for secure storage of the votes during the period in which a contest could be filed. So a couple, three years of secure storage. Um, and then those were all the requirements that the Secretary of State had to say, yes, this system achieves all of those things. Um, and I bless it for use in a CID. Um, the Secretary of State opposed this bill and I didn't, I didn't manage to get their full letter, but the excerpt in the Senate Judiciary Committee analysis, uh, the Secretary of State said they didn't think that any system could achieve those, all of those goals. Um, and the other thing is I think in terms of what we would do if we were to work on this, this sets an extremely sensible low bar which is it identifies all the things that a successful electronic voting system would have to achieve. I, I can't think of any others. There might be others, but I can't think of them. These, this seems to me like, you know, the bill worked through a two year process. This is a pretty good list. Um, and then rather than leaving a, uh, a certification that a voting system would achieve those requirements, to the association, it required the statewide elected official in charge of elections to assess the adequacy of a, an electronic voting system and certify it, that it meets all these requirements and only then can you use it. Um, and that failed, right? Uh, I don't know what we would add that would change the politics of this um, or the practicalities of it. I mean, if, if the groups that support this think that the climate has changed or the technology has changed, they could rerun the bill uh, and see whether or not the legislature has an appetite for it. But I think it's a pretty good approach um, to ensuring that the systems are technically secure um, and certifying that with somebody who doesn't have a stake in the outcome except their, their role as custodian of voting processes. Um, so I, I really don't know, if we were to study this, I don't know what we would add to it that, that this bill didn't already achieve if it had been enacted, which it wasn't. Um, so aside from the issue of controversiality, which I understand people have different takes on that, uh, I just don't even know what more we could do um, other than just decide, yeah, we think this is good. <laughs> Try again, see if the legislature likes it now, which I don't think would be a good yeah. use of our resources. Uh, Commissioner Rubin? Yeah, I, I am going to uh, agree that we should defer to the Secretary of State's findings in this issue that of the legislature as well. Uh, with the caveat that this is a somewhat problematical area as evidenced by the fact that there's been a lot of controversy about it. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, and I hopeful that others would agree that uh, we are as a commission supportive of transparency in the things that we look at because it is important that we be protective of the ideas behind transparency, which had not just in this age, but in any age, are important precepts to retain democratic principles. Uh, that's really all I want to say, but, but I just wanted to make those comments. No, I think those are good comments. Um, and especially in light of what we've heard from the audience, just with the hiding of the ball, politics in the voting, it just, it does bother you. Um, do we have any comments from the audience? Mr. Sir, you're gone. <laughs> Mr. They're all still there. They just know hands up. Yeah, no, I just was checking. Uh, and Ms. Brown, you guys, okay, Mr. Sir does have a comment. <laughs> Let's see what he has to say. No, I just want to tell you, I am still here and watching, and I do agree with the recommendation. This is such a fraught area, and particularly we're in the middle of a 
of an election now. And let's wait to see what happens with this one in November. Uh, I'm, the, the main worry, of course, is security of the election process. Yeah. Do we want to call the question? I'll call it. Okay, Mr. Rubin, uh, Commissioner uh, Rubin called it, and it looks like uh, Commissioner Carrillo uh, uh, seconded it. I Are second we all that. in? Yeah, is the motion good. that we not study this? Yeah, yeah we should not. It as is, yeah. Um, all in favor of letting the, okay, <laughs> the study stand. Okay, very good. Uh, all of us are in agreement. There's no abstentions, then no one, no opposition. We don't, want, we don't want Russia choosing our homeowner association boards for us. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I know. So having no further, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm uh, Diane, I know you already heard us say thank you. If we could just take a moment. Uh, Brian, do we have any other pending issues? Um, Linda Brown raised her hand after the oh. motion. Approved, so you could hear from her if you'd like to. Ms. Brown? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I got a little distracted. This may be off no topic. Worries. Um, I, I thank you very much for, for this opportunity. I would really encourage you to continue supporting transparency, but I think it was said earlier, you only write the laws, and then quite frankly, if there's not a compliance effort that's beyond the civil courts that are too expensive, uh, not a lot's going to be done. So please uh, tell the legislatures they need to work on the compliance side. And part of that can just be education. If people, if, if all of these laws are presented in a way non-lawyers can understand them and the updated information gets to everyone two or three times a year without every HOA or every individual having to pay $400, $500 an hour to get it. Uh, it would be very helpful. Thank you. No, I mean, your, your points are appreciated. And I do, I just would urge you to work with advocacy groups. Uh, the laws are, we, you hear from us, if you, you've, I think you've attended now a couple of meetings. I mean, our goal is always to make the law user friendly. Uh, so we would urge, uh, you know, for you and any groups that you work with to make sure that, you know, that you guys enforce the law. The law is good, and, and, but it does need to be enforced. Um, thank you for attending to the audience, and I do want us, if you guys can join me, I just want to just say I'm, I'm going to be sad about <laughs> Diane leaving. I'm sure the staff is too. I'm happy Commissioner Carrillo is on because we had our huge connection to the Uniform Law Commission that we're going to lose with this, uh, or with Diane, I'm just <laughs> We're losing our cut to the chase, go call the question. We're losing our style and form editor, chief. And uh, just, she's such a, she's been such a huge resource. I hope you don't mind we bug you again and, and you'll go down in our annals like uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Sterling or Matt Sterling. So um, thank you, Diane. I salute you. If we can just clap and just thank her again, because it's we have so little in this time to be thankful for. Um, thank you, Diane. Okay. I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting then. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you catch you next. Uh, what, Brian, when's the next meeting? October. I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head. That's it's fine. on the website and we'll be sending an agenda out. You guys That's be fine. safe. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Goodbye. Stay away from the fires. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right. Good meeting.